State Fair. A lot of color to it. It's a party, it's the atmosphere. And it's the unexpected. Oh, in trouble out in turn number two. And it's a bunch of guys going real fast on the racetrack, making a lot of noise. It's exciting. It's NASCAR, fast cars, Big stars. I'm a Kevin Harvick fan. Jeff Gordon, baby. Mark Martin. Junior. Gotta go with Junior. Matt Kansas, because he's yellow. Kyle Petty is a personal favorite of mine. I gotta say Jimmy Johnson because Jimmy let me wreck his car, and he's been a good sport about it. NASCAR's more than a sport. That's a lot more than cars turning left. It's a big business. It's been a phenomenal uh, success for the state of North Carolina. Generating billions of dollars and thousands of jobs. So it's extremely important to our economy and it all also has tremendous growth potential. In North Carolina, these cars ride on wheels of fortune. NASCAR's come a long way in its nearly 60 year history. A sport built largely by bootleggers is now fueled by Fortune 500 companies. Most of that industry is based here in North Carolina, and recent studies reveal startling numbers that show just how much our state depends on it. Car racing breached Daytona Beach in the early 1900s. To grow the sport, Daytona driver Bill France helped found the National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing in 1948. The first official NASCAR race was held at Charlotte Speedway the following year. There were races sometime where half the guys were uh, ex-bootleggers or current bootleggers. Junior Johnson. Bootleggers like Wilkes County's Junior Johnson, who developed his driving skills trying to outrun the law. You knew how to maneuver a car and handle it to outrun them. They didn't have a chance to catch it if something didn't happen to your car. Racing was predictably rough and tumble. They'd race a while, fight a while, and, uh, and wreck each other a while. With little regard for the rules. I didn't never see a rule book. <laughs> Dirt tracks eventually gave way to paved ones, but as a business, NASCAR struggled in the 50s and 60s. We called it a business and felt like it was a business, but basically it was a hobby. Nice. That's Beautiful. good. We had to constantly come up with uh, innovative things to get uh, in the paper or on TV or whatever it was. Here comes Curtis Turner to his pit. Drivers worked on their own cars. You did it with four or five guys. Uh, that's all you had and that's all anybody had then. 250 miles and no let up. Most of the major speedways went bankrupt at some point. It was difficult to make money promoting races. It was almost impossible to make money running a race car. Oh, Dave Pearson hits the wall. But the sport had one thing going for it. Fans wanted more of it. And the fans kept coming. We kept saying, if we could ever build modern facilities that were clean, that were neat, um, what would happen to this sport? Something did happen in 1971. R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company decided to sponsor NASCAR. They came in with an expertise in how to sell something. RJR couldn't sell its cigarettes on TV anymore, so it decided to put its ad money into NASCAR in the form of the Winston Cup Series. They began to promote the sport. They began to, to fix the racetracks up. Everything was painted red and white. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They get again. They climb into the turn. They're hitting the wall. Television took notice. In 1979, the Daytona 500 became the first race to be televised live from beginning to end. And there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. Rusty Wallace is among them. Oh! Two years later, NASCAR struck a deal with the new ESPN cable network. The pressure is put on by me and by you. ESPN needed programming and NASCAR needed TV. So ESPN got NASCAR for free. Daryl Waltrip has won the Trans-South 500. ESPN televised those races and didn't pay a dime in rights fees. And now they pay $5 million. That's how far the sport has come. Oh, Kenseth 
goes around off the front end of Gordon. In 2001, NASCAR borrowed from the NFL playbook, selling the broadcast rights for races to the television networks. And it expanded beyond cable to the major broadcast networks. And what that did was fundamentally change uh, the viewership and the advertising potential that uh, corporations saw. Corporate sponsorship money paid to race teams tripled. About 90% of those teams are based in our state, and 73% of motorsports employees work here. A UNC Charlotte study shows the motorsports industry contributed $5.9 billion to the state's economy in 2005, with NASCAR making up about $4.8 billion of that. I don't think anybody had an idea of how big it was. The study also says the industry has created around 27,000 jobs in our state. Average wages and in in benefits in the industry are about double those of the average job in North Carolina. The average annual salary in the motorsports industry in North Carolina is around $70,000. Next, where does all the NASCAR money go? Now, even the guys that work in the pit crews got our planes, you know. <laughs>NASCAR races held here at Lowe's Motor Speedway near Charlotte pump hundreds of millions of dollars into the area's economy. But take a look at the big picture of NASCAR in North Carolina, and you realize those races are like a single square in a checkered flag. Fans are what fuel the growth of NASCAR. I like everything about it. Been a fan uh, since back in uh, about 86. I just love it. Just love the race. It's good fun. Plain and simple. 31, we're working on 54. All right. NASCAR fans spend a lot of money at races. Take it out. With the tickets and everything, maybe 500. Picked up a couple of Kevin Harvick things. Hats, t-shirts, beer. Anything, what they got, you know. Then there's the money fans spend on restaurants, hotels, and campgrounds. Thousands of race fans pull their RVs into Tom Johnson Camping Center across from the Speedway for the spring and fall races. So economically, it's a, it's a huge impact for us in two months. The UNC Charlotte study says our state's three NASCAR races generate nearly a half billion dollars. But what we found out very simply was that the races aren't the big part of it. That's a kind of the tip of the iceberg. NASCAR race teams account for most of the rest. A look at Richard Childress Racing shows why. In many ways, RCR mirrors NASCAR's rags to riches story. In 1962, Childress was 17 years old and working in a textile mill in Kernersville. He and a friend decided to chip in 10 bucks each to buy an old taxi cab and turn it into a race car. We flipped the coin, he got to race it the first time and I raced it the next week and uh, was running fourth and broke a wheel and uh, I said, man, I love this, I gotta have me a car. So the next week we went out and bought another old car and we were a two car team in two weeks. Childress joined the NASCAR circuit as a driver and team owner in 1969. He drove until 1981 when he hired his friend, Dale Earnhardt, to replace him. It's just such a big sport today, and it's a family sport. A sport that has made Childress one of the most successful team owners in the business. He has a fleet of planes and a staff of 20 people to fly and maintain them at the local airport. He has 14 buildings on his sprawling complex in Welcome, North Carolina. They include this 40,000 square foot museum filled with black number three cars. This is Richard's tribute to his best friend, Dale Earnhardt. Childress's facility has 400,000 square feet of shop space and nearly 400 employees. Because the sport has grown so big over the last few years, everybody wants to get involved, so we pull from just about everywhere. Fabricator Carl Cox came from Illinois. I got friends and family back home that just put me right up there with the, with the race car drivers say, hey, you know, I know a guy that works at RCR, you know, he builds stuff. And... RCR has done so well that Childress planted some of his money in the region's blossoming wine industry. Richard and Dale had, you know, traveled to California and toured the wineries and really had gotten bitten by the wine bug. 
So far, Childress seems to be a winner in the wine field, too. We'll actually get more people through our winery when, than we will the museum. And he's going to ruin Ch Richard Childress's engine, but I don't think he much cares. <laughs> but racing reaps the richest rewards for both Childress and the local economy. Since teams like RCR build their own cars, they rely mostly on local vendors. We estimate that there are over 600 uh, suppliers of components for racing vehicles and racing applications in North Carolina. The jobs created by those companies and the race teams they supply mean people have money to spend. People are buying homes, they're buying automobiles, they're, they're spending a lot of money. Y'all ready for a race shop tour? There's also a tourism industry growing up around the NASCAR business in our state. Right. And Dale Earnhardt lived with his son, Dale Earnhardt Jr., his daughter Kelly, and his wife Brenda years ago in that mobile home park. Trisha Fuller founded Race Shop Tours after seeing fans with maps struggling to find all the race shops in the area. But this is the 525 shop. So putting them all together is basically what I do and then teaching people while we're here. This is a super speedway and then next door you have a speedway. At Hendrick Motorsports, Bob and Ellen Rader of Fort Walton Beach were amazed by the spacious, spotless shops, the glistening glass facades, and the helipad. It all started with a race on the beach at Daytona, and this is what it ended up to be. This is fabulous. Bob and Vicki McCommons of Tampa decided to tour the shops and museums on their own. It's kind of neat to see how much money is involved in this whole thing, like those cars and the shops and everything. And guys, you should be in fourth gear when you're going around the racetrack, okay? At the Richard Petty Driving Experience in Concord, fans can actually drive a real race car. Up in Kannapolis, they can drive their own car to follow the Dale Trail. Dale Earnhardt was, you know, more or less, you know, to NASCAR what Michael Jordan was to NBA basketball. And it's, uh, it's nice to just take it all in. To see places connected to Earnhardt's life, and his nine-foot bronze statue. I think for some it's almost a religious experience. It's a pilgrimage for them. They just are hungry to connect with his memory. There are even fans hungry for NASCAR art, which inspired this exhibit at the Hickory Museum of Art. The museum solicited mixed media works from artists all over the country, Canada and Great Britain. A lot of people have asked, will we do this again? <laughs> And I hope that we do. All the NASCAR related attractions have made much of the Piedmont a year round destination for fans. Any groups of people coming in together like Concord hotel time. owner Doug Stafford depends on that. I would have to say it probably contributes uh, to about 20 to 25 percent of our non race business. So it's a it's a major player for us. Happy to tell you today the NASCAR Hall of Fame is going to be right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> Now a new NASCAR attraction is on the way, the NASCAR Hall of Fame. It'll be built in downtown Charlotte. What it does is it's one more piece to the puzzle that says this is a tourist destination where you can spend a week if you're a race fan. City officials predict the NASCAR Hall of Fame will draw 400,000 visitors and generate $60 million for the area's economy every year. So this will be the centerpiece for travel and tourism to really see and touch and feel NASCAR and their fan base wants to see, touch it, and feel it and be a part of it. It's a growing fan base that's growing the sport. Next, the price of that progress for two North Carolina communities. It's so sad the way it's sitting here. NASCAR may be growing in North Carolina, but not without some growing pains. Two communities in our state have lost their NASCAR races, and with them, a little bit of their identity. If you didn't lay on that wall there and skin the side of your car up, you wouldn't in tune with what was really going on here. Back in the day, Junior Johnson ruled North Wilkesboro Speedway. If it was a dominant, you know, team, it was our team at this racetrack. We didn't want to get beat in our backyard. It's been a decade since the rumble of NASCAR engines filled the air here. 
I can remember on a Sunday afternoon sitting in my own back porch with my mom and dad and listening to that roar. And it does something to you. It's exciting. The races here went to larger tracks in larger cities. Because money is a big factor in, in NASCAR. They have to have the attendance. They have to create um, a larger number of people to come in and enjoy the race. And we couldn't do that here. Cheek says the community lost more than $2 million in annual revenue when it lost the races. So that was a huge economic loss regionally for our county and for our region. But the region lost much more than money. And it was just pride was lost because uh, racing was such a part of our heritage. NASCAR left the North Carolina Motor Speedway at Rockingham too. The races here also went to larger tracks in other states, leaving the rock and some businesses that depended on it by the wayside. A lot of people around the country identified, you know, North Wilkesboro and Rockingham with NASCAR racing. But, you know, to grow, you have to make some sacrifices. The NBA used to have uh, uh, a team in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The, the Canton Bulldogs were in the NFL. I mean, it's, 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 it happens to all sports, whether you, we like it or not. It's just the way it is. It's a loss to those communities. But because those races went to expand the fan base, which increased the advertising revenue, it was a net gain to the state because the industry is located in the state. Money may talk, but the words offer little comfort to Junior Johnson. It sure is sad the way it's sitting here. I, for one, don't like to see something just fall down. Next, building NASCAR up and keeping it in North Carolina. We could double what we're doing now. To learn more about the business of NASCAR, visit WRAL.com and click on News. There's no question about it, NASCAR is hugely popular. It has an estimated 75 million fans. The size of its television audience is second only to the NFL. The question is, how much will it grow? And how can our state keep it growing here? Number eight, 1994 NASCAR Rookie of the Year, Jeff Burton. I don't care much for country music or beer. Yeah. NASCAR has clearly hit the big time. Casey Kane. And grown well beyond its southern roots. The first time they went to Loudon, New Hampshire, just outside Boston, they sold all the tickets. This is, we are not a southeastern sport. We're based in the southeast. And I'm so glad we brought Kevin Harvick. NASCAR wants to make that distinction clear. This fan base is going to do nothing but grow. They're reaching out to minorities. They're reaching out to Hispanics. Mike North Carolina's number one fan wants to make sure the business of NASCAR continues to grow in our state as the sport of NASCAR grows in popularity around the country and the world. There he is, Governor Mike Easley coming out of his car after his three hot laps tonight at Lowe's Motor Speedway. Motorsports and NASCAR, that's, that's something that we do well here in North Carolina and we ought to be investing in it and expanding on it and I think the sky's the limit. We could double what we're doing now. We envision it to grow in real terms at five to six percent a year so nominally you put some inflation in there in ten years it could be double, yeah. All right, here we go. To nurture that growth, Governor Easley is offering incentives to race teams including tax breaks, free advertising, and more NASCAR related education and training programs at community colleges. Central Piedmont Community College has developed a motorsports machining certificate program to train people for work with race teams. We wanted to zone in on what their immediate needs were. Who is the driver? What size track are we going to? There are also certificate programs offered at the NASCAR Technical Institute in Mooresville. You learn every aspect of the race car here. There are classes in engines, chassis, bodies, and aerodynamics. The cars are complex, it takes special training, and uh, 
uh, you, you just can't get into the industry without some kind of knowledge of the race car. A skilled labor pool will go a long way to keeping race teams in North Carolina. It's hard to do business someplace else but here because of the labor pool. State leaders see the labor pool, the number of NASCAR teams already here, and a new Hall of Fame as a wall protecting North Carolina from other states wanting to take our teams away. There's more economic developers in the United States today than there are fire hydrants. <laughs> and they are working hard to attract NASCAR business. We've been, been approached by other states to move to other states uh, with a lot of uh, benefits to it, but I, you know, North Carolina's home to RCR and that's where we're going to be. Elliot Sadler. The only thing North Carolina's NASCAR supporters want to hear more than that is this. Gentlemen, start your engines.